Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the last candidate of January's Instructor <laughs> Development School 2021, John Mulroney. Two weeks. Everybody truly did a great job. Excellent, great job, everybody. I do this for a living, as some of you already know. And uh, I was actually very impressed. Everyone did very, very well. No real tankers, and I've seen a lot, a lot of tankers. <laughs> 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 anyway, my name is John Mulroney. The T Kai uh, presentation today is verbal judo, compassionate tactical communication. I found this online yesterday when I was poking around. There's a couple of institutes that actually teach this for a living. The NYPD employs this. And I was not taught this in the academy. I've been doing stand-up for 25 years, 35 years. We'll get to that in just a second in my bio. But when I was in the academy, I remember when they told us about having contact with the public, all I heard was stories. People would tell me, well, I had contact with this guy and he tried to tell me and he wasn't going to do something. I showed him. Like, what'd you show him? Well, I threw him on the ground, I helped him up with, you know, whatever. Use of force, whatever, you know, do what I had to do. Nobody ever gave me a system. So this system here is actually all wrapped up right in the title. Verbal Judo. We had a couple of jujitsu guys here, right? Some martial arts guys. You all know that ju judo comes from jujitsu. It means literally, if you hyphenate it in the middle, it means gentle way. Next line is compassion, which means with feeling or to empathize with somebody. And tactical communication, this is the part that I believe for police officers is probably the most key. Tactile, there's a couple of words in there, I love wordplay. Tact obviously means to do with sensitivity, and it comes from the root word uh, tactile, which means to touch. Sensitive communication, empathetic, sensitive communication. If you break down the word communication, obviously that's an exchange of information of energy and information. However, to commune, means to dwell within something, correct? You want to dwell, like people commune with nature, they don't communicate with it. So there's a lot wrapped up in there. We want to, when we have contact with the public, and even with each other, and even with our spouses or our children or other officers, from my perspective anyway, we always want to communicate, dwell, and exchange from a common base, a place that we all can relate to as human beings. And I know that most cops, I shouldn't say most cops, there's still a lot of cops, even guys that I work with, they don't commune at all. They walk in and they tell people what to do. And I don't know about you, but when someone tells me what to do, I don't like it. And I don't only really not like it, I react. And I don't just react, I react poorly. How many people here get angry and have a temper? How many here have a bad temper? You're weak. You're weak. If you have a bad temper, you're weak. If you engage in your temper, that's also weak. But a bad temper is dangerous. A bad temper on this job will get you killed. I believe we all know that. So, instructor bio. That's me, John A. Mulroney. I am single, never married. 62 years old chronologically, six years old emotionally, and about three mentally. That's my social security number. <laughs> I have life up, fuck you. <laughs> I have two kids, but we don't know who the mother is. That's a joke. <laughs> of crap. <laughs> I've been sober for 10 years. This is a big part of my training. I don't know if anybody else in here is comfortable with sharing whether or not they've suffered from an addiction. Anybody? Anybody have any issues with drinking? If you, want to, if you don't have, if you don't want to, that's fine. But this was a big part of my life, getting sober. A lot of the principles that I have learned and I use and I employ when I do my verbal judo, uh, I learned from sobering up, basically, because I had to find something greater than myself to tap into, to guide me through my life, to guide me through my situations, because obviously, Something that I was doing was not working. It's one of these things that they say in LA, you know, your best thinking got you here. And I used to say to the guy saying that, well, you're here too. <laughs> so, so much for that. So, getting sober has really shown me a lot. I've had many moments of clarity. I'll give you one for instance. 
I had a couple of quote unquote interventions where my family was really concerned about. You want to talk about a wake up call. It was Thanksgiving just about, it was 10 years ago actually, this Thanksgiving just passed. And they were so concerned about me, I wasn't answering emails, I wasn't, I wasn't answering texts, I wasn't answering the phone. I was living in Catskill, hub of culture. <laughs> and uh, I was so loaded, I, I you know, just let the phone die basically. There's a knock on the door. I opened the door, there's a woman standing there. John, she's my sister, I didn't even recognize her. I look, it's my brother, I look, it's my mother. And that was the first big wake up call. I'll never forget my mother grabbed me by the face and she said, No more scares, please, no more. Something very unique happened that day. Uh, they talked again, they talked about these moments of clarity where a curtain opened up for just a second. I will never forget it. Even in the stupor that I was in, all of my defenses, all of my psychological defenses suddenly dropped. And I was able to see for just a second, hey, this isn't you. This is not where you belong. This is not who you are. This wasn't the beginning of the journey. This was actually closer to the end of it because what came next is what I'm going to share with you in regards to some of the stuff that's here. Obviously, as I said, professional entertainer for 35 years. If you guys have friends or family members that are looking to break into the business of show, especially stand-up comedy, I would suggest you ask them to speak to me first because <laughs> I will enlighten them as to the, uh, the path that they're about to embark on. I've made my living pretty much encouraging or moving or motivating people to do things. I don't want to say that they didn't want to do it. I mean, everybody likes to laugh. But I've made my living in front of people, speaking with people, uh, motivating them to do things, motivating them to like me, motivating, motivating them to pay me. This is kind of interesting. 35 years, almost 40 years I've been doing this. Everything I have, I bought with jokes. It's funny because my, my high school teacher used to say, you guys are probably jokes. Yeah, right? I know I went to, to, to uh, lunch with Kevin and Rick. You guys were hysterical. Did you have that teacher who said, that's very funny, Mr. Martin. <laughs> what are you going to do when you graduate? Get a job telling jokes? Okay. <laughs> Fuck you. Been a cop for 10 years, a hair bag for two, and I'm COVID positive. <laughs> how long have I been in show business? Well, that's how long. Who knows Jackie Marley from the Howard Stern Show? Okay, this is a list of comedians working in 1980. This was taped to his desk. You can see the coffee stains, how long it was up there, okay? These were all the working comedians. There were a few more down here, but these were most of the working comedians from 1980. I am number 34, John Mulroney, when we were 212 in Brooklyn. Who remembers that? 212, Brooklyn? Look who's number 35. Eddie Murphy. So this is, and down here, Bob Nelson. Anybody know Bob Nelson? So this is how long I've been doing it. This is where I started out. Uh, this is the year, I, actually the week I graduated the academy. I wound up opening up for Jeff Foxworthy right here at the Mid-Hudson Civic Center. Uh, he didn't know I, I was going through the academy. It was kind of funny. I showed up with that stupid Stetson net we wear. I went to the dressing room and he walked in. I walked in, he didn't recognize me. I had my glasses on. I was looking all badass with all my shiny stuff. And he said, can I help you, sir? I said, yeah, you can help me. Where's my fucking dressing room? And then we had a good laugh about it, so we've been doing this for a while. Professional resume, film. I was in Great Walls of Fire with Dennis Quaid. Does anybody remember Dennis Quaid in Great Walls of Fire? All right. Mm -hmm. I played Jack Carr. He was the host of The Tonight Show before Johnny Carson. Johnny Carson was before Jay Leno. <laughs> <laughs> you have a little formula right here. <laughs> Television, shit ton of television. How much? Oh my God, look at all this television I did. And, then, and this is only the stuff that I could get actually on the screen. Um, I was on Hollywood Square, does anyone remember that show? Mm -hmm. Hollywood Square. I did that with Howard Stern and Joan Rivers. I hosted a show called uh, The Late Show on Fox. I took that off from Joan Rivers. I hosted another show called Comic Ship Live on Fox. Basically, you have been standing in front of people 
for most of my adult life doing something that hopefully was entertaining, informational, or uh, fun. Uh, radio, I started out in New York City doing afternoons. Um, I then went up to Albany to work with a guy by the name of Bob Wolf, who used to be on WPA. We had a kick-ass show, it was called Waking Up with Wolf Mulroney. Uh, then went back down to the Hudson Valley with a guy named Mark Cooper. You ever know Mark Cooper? Remember Mark Cooper? You remember Mark Cooper, right? Dude, that guy, do you remember listening to him on the air? Oh, yeah. He was so whacked out on coke. He would come in in the morning. He used to take the roll of, of uh, hand towels from the men's room, put it on the desk, blow his nose into it, ball them up, and shove them along the, the, the board like this. He's just giant snot balls. This is the guy I had to work with for a year. Obviously, that didn't last long. 24 7 comedy radio, buzzard in Cleveland, a bunch of stuff. Oh, I wound up uh, doing weekends for Howard on uh, Sirius Satellite Radio. Some of you may remember the full point opposition that I used in my 10 minute presentation. Um, that was actually uh, a true story. I walked in and within 10 minutes, after telling Tim Sabian, his Howard's then program director, how I was able to beat Howard in Albany, I had the job in Sirius. So I did that for a while for Howard and then worked back up in Albany again. So what is verbal judo? It is tactical. We went over a little bit what tactical is. It is to touch or to touch with attention. It is compassionate. It is empathetic. It is with feeling. Communication. Uh, we know some of you guys already pointed this out already. Judo was created in 1882 uh, from jujitsu. Again, meaning the way or the gentle way. It was created by Dr. How do you pronounce his name? Jigoro Mayo. Jigoro, what he said. And this guy was a physician, apparently. And he invented judo because he saw all of the injuries that were being caused by jujitsu. And he thought there's got to be an easier way to, to you know, get people to comply physically. So he came up with judo, which was, which was less, I guess, uh, injurious than jujitsu. It means the gentle way. Okay, the objective of our course today. At the end of this course, you will be able to cite the three most important goals of police work. In addition to, you will be able to name the five universal truths of human interaction. Identify M3 equals C3 of police interaction. We're also going to do a little bit of E3. We'll get to that in a second. List the three most common Conversational mistakes. I still do these. I'm still working on these. You probably all do. And then apply the tactical five-step process. And as I said before, and of course, pass the quiz on this. As I said before, uh, nobody gave me the steps to compliance, to ver excuse me, voluntary compliance. They just basically showed me what they were doing. And then I found out after reading this book and studying some of these principles, uh, very, very basic stuff. The key to success is not a key, it's a system. This system, once I learned it, and once I pointed it out to you, you'll be able to not only apply it regularly, just like you have a system when you do your SFSTs, you do them in an order. When you do a traffic stop, you do them in an order. Nobody ever pointed out to me that when you have contact with public and it looks like it may lead to an arrest, you do it in an order. And you can do it so that when you write your report, you're able to say each and every time, well, officer, why did you, how did you get to this level of force with this subject? How was it you, my, my, my client was, got to, got into your custody at this time? You're going to be able to articulate with this five-step process every single time how it was you got your client, your client and your customer, your subject, to that point. You may be able to break it down in a report. It looks really good if you're going to go to court with it also. So, Verbal Judo was written by this gentleman, Jack, uh, George J. Thompson, he's a PhD. Doc, I don't know if you've ever seen this guy speak. He's pretty gruff. I mean, these principles work, but this is a guy, to me, who is the classic example of form versus content. I, if you remember the other day, I, I Define the difference between form and content. Uh, Mike Angelou once said that people may not remember who you are, 
They may not remember what you do or what you said, but they will always, always, always remember how you made them feel. To me, this guy is a perfect example of good form, uh, almost zero content, because while he's got the steps down, his content is still, in my opinion, very aggressive. You all remember that, that little uh, exercise we did, where I said, remember your favorite teacher growing up? You all have a picture in your mind of your favorite teacher? Remember the worst teacher you ever had that instantly come to mind? You probably remember very little about what, what they taught, but you remember how they taught it. And I had a lieutenant once who said to me, and he still works with me, I know him, uh, Alex Landolina. Some of you guys know Alex? Okay. Alex was the one who hit me to it. He said, and I love this, he said, whenever you have contact with anybody, he said, I don't care who it is. He said, if they don't walk away from their, con their contact with you, feeling grateful, doesn't mean they have to be happy, but feeling grateful, he said, you haven't done your job. And I was, that's a great ideal, that's a great standard to hold myself to. In fact, when I got this job, the way I became a police officer was through a guy by the name of Dave Dean, classic hardcore homicide guy. He had worked with the Marshals Task Force. He was up in Troy. He was responsible for spot sh uh, sh shot spotter up in Troy. We had a big case break open in Albany. He was the public information officer. So I called him to get a statement. And he was so funny, we never actually spoke about the case, I had him on the air, it was hysterical, we, we spoke for an hour, and the guy was just great. So it turned into a regular segment that we did called Ask Officer Dave. I became very friendly with Dave after about a year, he saw how passionate I was about police work. And he said to me, hey listen, I know this department up in Kokshaki that's looking for guys, if you're interested. I was, I was rolling up on 52 at the time, I said, Dave, 52 years old, what are you talking about? He goes, no, it's not like that out there, you know. If you can pass the uh, physical requirements for a 52 year old, you're in. So a year later, I was driving fast with a gun. <laughs> and so Dave, I said to Dave one time, because he was telling me these great stories, man. Every cop has great stories. He's telling me these great stories about all of this stuff that he did. And I said, uh, hey Dave, did you ever use your weapon in anger? And he laughed at me. He said, my mind's my best weapon. I never use it in anger. It's like, whoa. That's hip. I use those two principles. I remember what Alex told me, and I remember what Dave told me. I go the gentle way as often as I can, every single time. Thankfully, in the 10 years that I've been doing this, I've only had to go hands-on maybe 10, 12 times. I mean, like really stupid Donnybrook shit. You guys know what I'm talking about. Because I've been able to remain in this place that I'm about to show you. So these are the two visuals for verbal judo, okay? You know who Keith Richards is? No. Did you say no? No. I didn't. Kill yourself. Get the fuck out. <laughs> Would someone enlighten our young friend who Keith Richards is? Rolling Stones. Rolling Stones, baby. Rolling Stones. You're not going to know the bottom. You're getting red, dude. You look like a bottom of a thermometer. You're getting bad. <laughs> no. <laughs> Keith Richards. Tars for the Rolling Stones, was in an interview with Bob Costas, who was brilliant, by the way, had a great, he had a real uh, talent for asking the right question at the right time to the right person. And uh, he did this hour-long interview with Keith, which was great, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. At the very end, he goes, Keith, 30 seconds left. He said, give me your best one-line identifier for Mick Jagger. He didn't miss a beat, he was smoking a cigarette. He went, Mick's a great bunch of guys. And I fell down laughing and I thought, that's brilliant. Aren't we all a great bunch of guys? That's what you have to be on patrol. We all know that. We're all a great bunch of guys. The cobra is the ability to shape shift and be a great bunch of guys. Excuse me, the chameleon is the, is the symbol for a great bunch of guys. And the cobra strikes without warning. Unlike a rattlesnake that tells you it's there, you don't know the cobra's there until you get bit. So, you're a great bunch of guys that you never see coming. That's the mindset for me to be on patrol. I'm always ready to pull out whatever guy I need out of the bag to deal with the situation. But 
always, 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 it starts with compassionate communication. So your mind is your best weapon. You never use it in anger. I did this little exercise with my niece and nephew recently, and they just, uh, she's autistic, my niece. She's an amazing energy, this kid. She can take over the world. And I gave this uh, visual to her, and she still uses it. What happens when you put a D in front of anger? You get danger. So for you guys that raise your hands, and gal, if you raise your hands in regard to your anger, remember, every time you feel the anger coming on, you've lost control. You're not in the gentle way anymore. This takes practice. Practice, practice, practice. You may have heard this old joke about a violin player who stops a cab driver in Times Square in New York City and he says to the cab driver, can you tell me how to get to Carnegie Hall? And the cab, he says, yeah, practice, practice, practice. <laughs> this takes practice. This works with everyone, not just whoever you have contact with on, on patrol. Creation versus reaction. We're doing this every minute of our life. If you notice, this is an anagram for that. Creation is an anagram for reaction. It all depends on how you see it. You're either creating or you're reacting. Every single moment of your life right now, you're either creating or you're reacting. If you're bored with me right now, you're reacting. You're not creating. You can create peace in a gentle way in your mind, regardless, it's your choice. You're the one. How do we do that? We be responsible. That is, response able. We recognize we have the choice. We have the power. We are the ones in control. We choose, choose every single instant. You're doing it right now. Get into the habit of choosing this way of looking. Tactical breathing. We spoke about this the other day. Thank you. you want to explain again to the, uh, to the I was going to say the audience, to the class. Tactical breathing, you, you use it yourself, correct? When you're in a high stress situation, your sense is kind of dull and you're just hyper focused. So it's that momentary pause to take a deep breath and regain your senses. That's correct. Take everything in again. That's right. What happens is when you're, the vascular system in your face and your head literally begins to constrict, you've all experienced it. You get myopia or tunnel vision as it's called. If you don't clear that, what happens is your ability to comprehend and calculate moves to the midbrain. The midbrain is very similar to a dog brain. It's almost identical to a canine brain. So imagine trying to reason with your dog <laughs> when you're trying to get something done. This is really what happens. You've all experienced it. I know I have that so mad at somebody on patrol. I just literally stood it. Thankfully, I was with you know other veteran officers, and I would feel a hand on my back. I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna kill this motherfucker. I'm gonna get away. We all know that guy, right? Tactical breathing, a nice. I still use it, dude. You you got shot. Did you did, did you use that when you were when you did you suffer hyperventilate when you got when you were shot during your I, No, I I ran on through the roof. Just, yeah, through the roof, right? Okay, so at that point he was totally reacting. And that's okay, that's when you go into survival mode. But prior to that, you, you recognize at least though, you didn't even have the chance, your, your, your body took over, survival mode took, takes over. That's what happens. So this is the shift in perspective. We're not here to enforce the law. We are here to uphold the peace. Big difference, total shift in perspective. There's a whole, the way police work is going now, when we go out on patrol, at least when I go out on patrol, this is the goal. We all, we're all going home safe. I don't have any different goal than you. No matter who I meet, no matter who I'm having contact with, we're all going home safe at the end of the day. That's our common ground. Police officer versus peace officer. Force versus power. We are a police force, but we should be empowering the people that we have contact with. How do we do that? Tactical empathetic communication. You can't give what you don't have. Does that make sense? If we show up to a situation and we ourselves are not empathetic, if we're not feeling peace, if we haven't chosen that for ourselves, if we're reacting to whatever it was, you had a bad day, your arm from your shooting is hurting you, you know, you got kids that were acting up. 
if you are if, if you will if you allow yourself to take that on control, here's what's going to happen. You're going to revert to what you know. You're going to revert to force over extending power. Three most important goals of police work. We've covered this ad nauseum. It, it, you can't say it enough. Safety, safety, safety. Number two, safety and professionalism. And then safety and performance. Once we have, once, once we, these are innate, we always act professional and that ultimately enhances our performance. Can't say it enough. Everyone goes home safe. We're all here, thankfully. Even though you were injured pretty severely, you're here, you're safe. Thank you. Use the force. No longer use the force continuum. Who was talking yesterday about that? No longer use the force continuum with their department. So did, did they ban that just for your department? No, it should be in New Okay, because we still have policies and stuff. You guys know where your policies are. Article 35, easy enough. Uh, I just had to go through this retraining myself. Everyone here is familiar with Article 35 and, and force escalation and the use of force. And of course, use of deadly force, but it just needs to be reiterated for the purposes of our course this morning. And this seems to be apparent, but a lot of guys don't get it. The appropriateness of the force used depending on the extent and type of resistance encountered. That seems like a no-brainer, but <laughs> we all work with people that don't understand that, that basic principle. This is a little acronym that I like to use, RADOS. I'll cover it in more detail as we go on. Everybody, everybody wants to be treated with respect, man. You know what we're talking about. Serious respect to the people. People want to be asked. They want to be told what to do. Nobody likes to be told what to do. They want to be asked. Nicely, preferably. And again, there's a difference between form and content. I could say, can you please step over here? No, I already asked you. You could, you know. And then there's, I asked already. Form and content. Inform them as to why you're asking them to do this. So many guys I know jump right, and women jump right over this. And they blow on in sometimes to your call, you're handling it, and they run in and they start, they, they think they're in charge of the call. And they start telling people why they should and or shouldn't do something. We, we do all dealt with that jackass, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. and, and here's an interesting thing. When that happens, I've actually had to turn around and use these tactics on the people backing me up. Sheriffs show up, we have the state troopers, security guards, you name it. They're, they're all in it. Options, not threats. Give them good reasons as to why. Make them positive reasons as to why. Don't tell them what they should do or they're going to get themselves in trouble. Make it, learn to communicate within their value system. Try to figure out when you get on the scene what's a value to a person. You can tell pretty much. You can give a read very quickly as to what something has value to them. Just, you know, by the way they're dressed, just indicators that are around them, the way their car is set up, uh, tattoos they may have, clothing they may be wearing, uh, things they may have in their, in, you know, close proximity. You can do a pretty good read when it comes to things like this. And people love second chances. Now this is more for dealing with the, uh, personally, than the, than, than the public. We're going to get to uh, the, the public in just a second. Public contact, like we're having contact with someone as a police officer. This is more for you as, let's say, a parent. Kids need second chances, right? You're not going to tell your kid to do something and they don't do something right away. Drop the hammer. You might use the fly swatter once or twice and then move on to the next more uh, enforceful M3 equals C3, we need to move, motivate, and manipulate so that we can gain cooperation, collaboration, and compliance. I'm 
just curious, uh, do, does anyone here have a common way that they uh, use, does anyone else have a system other than this when they're in contact with the public to get them to do something that they want, or do you just go by and by? Does anyone have, been, have you ever been directed by your department a set of guidelines that tells you, here's what to do in regard to getting uh, voluntary compliance from a subject? Have you ever been trained in anything? Did you ever wonder why? You all kind of have your own flavor? Is that, is that again, everybody just figures it out as they go along? Okay. Very good. All right. This is a fun little game. I don't know if anybody knows this little memory peg game. The mind communicates in pictures. If you can build a picture for someone, they're much more likely to be motivated or have you move them or manipulate them with a picture. They don't do well with words. And I'm going to show you how this works. Do you know the, the list of, of 20 items that you can repeat by memory? Okay, here they are. Try to remember these. Number one is tree. Number two is light switch. Number three is stool. Number four is car. Five is glove. Six is gun. Seven is dice. Eight is skate. Nine is cat. Ten is bowling ball. Eleven, goal posts. Twelve is eggs. Thirteen is witch. Fourteen is ring. Fifteen. Fifteen is paycheck. <laughs> Sixteen is candy. 17 is magazine, 18 is boat, 19 is golf club, 20 is cigarettes. You guys want to try? <laughs> what was one? Three. 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 Two. Light switch. Nine. Goal post. Nope. Crap. 12. Thanks. 15. Start to pick up on it. Here's how it works. Number one is tree. Think of a tree, look at the trunk of the tree. Number one. It's number one in a tree, all right? Can you see that visual? Number two is light switch. Up, down, on, off, light, dark. Two position, okay? Three, stool. Three legs on a stool. Four is car. You'd say a four in depth. Four wheels, four on the floor, car. Five <clears throat> is glove. Six, gun. I think revolver, six gun. Seven, dice. Lucky number seven. Eight, skate. It also rhymes. Figure eight, skate. Nine is cat. Cat has nine lives. Cat has nine tails. Bowling ball. There's 10 pins in a lane. Also, if you can build this image, number one, number zero, bowling ball coming into it. All right, bowling ball. 11, goal posts. 12, you got it. You said eggs. You saw it right away, right? Doesn't. 13, oh, I missed, I missed 13. Which? 14. Well, which 13? Because unlucky 13. Uh, which on a broom? 14, 14 karat gold ring. 15, and many people get their paycheck on the 15th of the month. Sweet 16 is candy. 17, 17 rounds in a magazine, or 17 magazine. So I don't even know if they have any more. 18, you have to be 18 to vote. 19, you go off here off on the you know that the club is the uh, clubhouse is often called the 19th hole, correct? Uh, and of course, there are 20 cigarettes in a pack. All right. Now, without looking at this, can you let me go to the next slide? Can you name three? Five. Eight. Twelve. Twenty. You see how building the picture immediately gets a response in your mind? If I just said eggs to you, or just said to you, number 12, you wouldn't have an image. You need to build positive pictures when you're dealing with people on patrol. 
You need to give them positive options. You need to build the picture to move, motivate, or manipulate them into compliance, cooperation, or collaboration. Forcing or just telling them what to do is liable to lead you to more resistance. It's a human dynamic. Nobody likes to be told. But if you communicate within their value system, if you begin to see by picking up your police officers, you guys are trained, and girls are trained observers, you begin to see what's of value to them. Build that picture to them, get them moved to it for you. Sun Tzu, the art of war, he said, all war is deception. The greatest battle that you can win is never fought. You don't need to go hands on, or if you don't need to go hands on, this is the best way that you can do it. All right, contact with the public, we all know this. Always, always, always involves someone under the influence of either fear, anger, drugs, alcohol, or all of the above. Every single time. Every single time. So I'm going to show you a little diagram that was helpful for me when dealing with the public. And again, because the mind communicates in pictures, this was helpful to me the first time I saw it. And it really, I still use it to this day. I'm going to show it to you guys. I hope you're able to take it and stick it in your tool belt. All right? Here is Officer Star in the middle here. That's a tree. Star. This Officer Star in the middle. All right? Here is George Navarro. <laughs> Here is the blockhead that we are dealing with. You know, it's funny about this. So, uh, when I was living in LA, I uh, tried to get on the LAPD reserve. And my recruiting officer was Officer Star. I went through all the training, did everything I had to do. And um, at the very last minute, it was like nine months of going through the background checks and all that other nonsense. The very last minute, I got disqualified because I was a comic. They said at the time they thought that I was too high profile and that I might be a target for the LAPD. So whatever. But this was Officer Star, my recruiting uh, recruiting officer. Anyway, so here's you representing your department, right? You are representing your department, not in a personal way. You are representing them professionally. You have to do an exchange of information, information and energy with Blockhead over here, who is not getting it. This person is under the influence of fear, anger, drugs, alcohol, or all of the above. You are never moving from a place, you're always staying in the gentle way, never moving from a place of personal perspective, always as a professional. Even if you have lost your temper, hopefully at this point in your career, you know what professional language looks and sounds like, so you fake it to your mate. So as this exchange goes on, as you continue to explain your position to this guy representing the authority, which this person hates, you don't move from the gentle way. You stay here in the middle path. I think they call it the middle path, correct? In the, uh, do they call it that in, in, um, in judo or any martial arts? Buddhism calls it the middle way. And some of the Hindu traditions also call it the middle way. It's, or Wu Wei, as it's called in, in Tai Chi, I believe, doing non doing. You're actually doing and undoing. You're standing here and you're allowing this information and energy to swirl around this guy as you're telling him why it is you need him to comply, cooperate, or collaborate. And what happens is, within time, hopefully a short amount of time, because you're always of patience. You know what the reward is for patience? Patience. According to A Course in Miracles, the only thing that brings immediate results is infinite patience. So as you stay in the infinite patience way, what happens is you disappear. You become no longer visible. Officer, the uh, subject blockhead over here begins to round off the rough edges, and then you can make your point for your department. We all do that. We do that every single time we're out on patrol. I know where I am. I have a tiny little... Uh, two square mile area to patrol. We rarely get involved in any big stuff. 99% of it is dealing with this guy or girl who doesn't get it. They want some ridiculous thing that they think is going to make them happy. 
I have to stand here and either act like I'm happy, which sucks, or actually be happy, or peaceful, or calm, or in the center, still play, place, and offer it to them. So, one way is fairly easy, one way is a little bit more difficult. One of the things I learned, I don't, I don't know if anybody here has a, uh, a practice that they use to calm the mind in general. I do. I get up every morning and I sit quietly for about 30 minutes to an hour if I can, and I just let everything kind of drop down. People, some people like to call it meditation. I like to call it meditation, calming the mind. There's a really cool principle, and this visual helps. When water moves in a column, you probably have all seen this. When water moves in a column, one side of the, the, the edge of the water or the side of the column of the water begins to move faster than the other side. This builds up pressure. And what happens is this pressure begins to overtake the column, the, the wall of the column on that side. So this pressure builds up. This one begins to turn. Then nature abhors a vacuum. They begin to straighten out because they want to be equal. And then they begin to turn this way. Then this one starts to speed up. And then that one tries to catch up. And this goes on and on ad infinitum. And this is what's called the meander. We all see that in nature, correct? I don't know if anyone's ever panned for gold. I have once. It was a lot of fun. And every uh, gold miner knows that you pan here in the area of low pressure because gold, being the second heaviest element on the, on the planet, this is where the gold drops. So this is the visual for lowering your pressure. If you can't sit and do it, watch yourself. Whenever you're feeling this kind of pressure out here, remember, you have to get into here because the goal is symbolic for the answer. Your intuition, your inspiration, and moving from the place of, the, of, uh, of, of peace is always going to come from here. This is going to be force. That's going to be power. This is your power, dropping the energy down. If you can hold it here long enough, what happens is this begins to swirl. This is where you are. And just one nugget after another, and pretty soon the blockhead is going to see that you're the most wise person on the planet. Building a positive picture. Reward versus punishment. I'm a big fan of Freud. Uh, positive reinforcement theory was uh, a principle of his. Parents know that using positive reinforcement as opposed to negative motivations is much more uh, useful, much, much more effective than using negative reinforcement. Like a dog, how many people have seen people treating a dog like, don't do that, beat their dog, don't do that. Try to stay away from negatives. Don't tell people what not to do. Explain to them what they should do and why they should do it. Again, back to building the picture. <clears throat> Avoiding negative words or phrases. Do not speak whenever possible. Don't speak in the negative. Contact means with touch. This is very important. You need to stay in touch. Literally means con with tact. Touch. You need to stay in touch with the subject. Never let them leave your area. I had a, <clears throat> an experience just this week where I had to apply this with a neighbor. My neighbor and my tenant have been in this ridiculous battle. I know COVID is stressing everybody out, but my neighbor and my tenant have been in this stupid battle over him plowing his snow over here, and she parks because I can't pull my car out, and the garbage cans are doing this, and then dig, 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 and the two of them are just using me as the middle person. And after a half a dozen, ten of these things, I want to strangle them both to death. And it happened actually this week. He called me up, my neighbor called me up. They're doing it again, and I can't put up with this. And I went, you need to stop, dude. You got to stop your bullshit right now. Click. I broke contact. I broke contact. I made it personal. Blockhead was working in fear and anger. I violated the rule. Oh, shit. I caught myself right away. I dialed him right back. I gained contact. Who's a negotiator here? Okay, Joe. Number one rule is it? How high is the rule, should I say, in regards to 
maintaining contact. Well, we want to maintain contact until they break contact. Until they break contact. Yep. Well, and we, then we agree to separate. I'm sorry. We agree to take a break. We agree, like we'll talk in a few minutes or whatever. Okay. So until they break it off, you maintain contact. I didn't. I didn't know that principle, but I knew something intuitively told me that wasn't going to work. So it brings us to: Do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? You know, everybody wants to be. Sometimes you can be right and happy at the same time. But I was right. Boom. Fuck you. Was it going to make me happy? No. It caused a lot more trouble. Hold me back. I got back in touch, and I stayed in touch. And here's something else that's interesting. I found this dynamic. You guys might see have found this yourselves. There's some weird energy that occurs when people are wrong, and they know they're wrong on some deep human level. I've seen it. I'm sure you you've all seen it. Recently, I was at a rental car place, and the young man behind the counter had been moving cars around and was reckless in the way he was doing it. And he almost clipped a kid. Now, I wasn't there to see it, but I showed up just as the woman who uh, was the grandmother of the kid was furious. She was furious, but controlled. And she's taking this kid to task. He's denying it. I'm standing behind her because I'm waiting to get my car. I'm standing behind her, and she is taking this kid to task. She's going, don't lie. You are driving like crazy, and you almost hit my grandson. And the kid's starting to go, ma'am, I, I really didn't. He goes, I'm, so I'm kind of busy right now. She goes, if you're wrong, you can't be strong. And I was like, whoa, that's pretty good. And he's going, yeah, yeah, you don't get, ma'am, but if you're wrong, you can't be strong. And she wouldn't budge. She just kept saying it over and over again. And this kid wasn't bud budging either for another minute or two. And then he just went, Phew. I'm sorry. You're right. She goes, feel, she, and she looked at him and she went, you feel better, don't you? And I even felt better, too. We all know when we show up on patrol, what do we have on our side? We have righteousness on our side. We're not police officers, we're peace officers. We're there to bring order out of chaos. And on some deep human level, they understand that. It's a dynamic I'm sure you've all felt. So keep that in your back pocket. Stay in touch. They know they're wrong. It's just going to take a little time from Officer Star to sand off the edges around the blockhead. Tactical content is touched with meaningful intent. Please, no jokes. <laughs> we have a goal at the end of, of our, there's, there's a method to our manners. We're not just looking to be in touch with you because uh, we want to be Facebook pals, right? Staying in the zone. Every athlete that I know speaks of the zone. You, you martial arts guys know about the zone, correct? I once, I recently found out the Zen of racquetball. This was the zone. A friend of mine who was a racquetball instructor, the kid was, this is an assassin, and he was a lefty, which made him doubly hard to beat. He was the instructor, and I was taking racquetball classes, and I was practicing every time I didn't have a game, and, and uh, working, with, always playing with guys who were above my level, because I just wanted to beat him. We were best friends, we're still best friends. His name's Dominic, he's very soft-spoken. He knew my game and he knew my head and he could get in my head and he could push my buttons and he loved it. And I actually kind of liked it too. But he's very soft spoken. And one day he, said, he used to say to me, Johnny, you know, when, you, when you beat me, you'll be a racquetball player. But you're a racquetball player. And he used to push my buttons with that. So one day we get on the court, we start playing, and it was effortless. Every shot, head shot, ceiling, drive serve, reverse serve. Backhand, cross court. I had him literally jumping out of his shoes. He was pulling every trick out of the bag. At the end, we were at, right at match point. You picked to play three games, and, and then it was match point on the last game. And the last, the last one was a drive serve about 110 miles an hour that hit right past the fair line and spun. He never got a racket on it. He threw the racket up in the air and he applauded. And he said, Daniels, today you're a racquetball player. What was the secret? And I said, Dominic, today I found out the Zen of racquetball. He said, what's that? I said, I was rooting for you. And he went like this, and I actually was. I got out of my head, and I was rooting for him. I found his value system. I found a common ground 
for the both of us. We both won. We both came away better players and better people. From that moment on, we played on a par. Never went back. Find the common ground, stay in the zone. You don't have separate goals from this individual. You all are going home safe. All right, verbal deflectors. Certain things that you can use to take in your mental tool belt. These are ones that I like to use when you're dealing with somebody who's, you know, persistent, you know. Yeah, and if you listen to them, you know, I can really appreciate that. But, okay. <laughs> I, hear, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. But, well, if it happened exactly the way you say it, I would agree with you. But, you're right. But, I completely understand that concern. But, after the but, only use professional language that serves or directs you to your objective, which is to get this person to comply, cooperate, or collaborate with you. After the but, only professional language. We all work with you all, a hair bag or two that uses whatever language he or she thinks is appropriate for the situation and it's a fucking embarrassment when I'm standing there in the same uniform and this person sounds like they're 10 years old on the schoolyard. Don't go down to their level. Now I gotta start over. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. The three I I don't. Don't interrupt. Let them talk. If you have time. I don't know how many a lot of your departments, probably Newburgh, you guys are holding calls all the time, right? You don't have much. Sometimes you have to interrupt, I'm assuming. You don't have one line where you can sit and listen to this sad sack of tragedy <laughs> and stand off their edges. Cooks up, you work a little bit. How many times, though, have you shown up to a call and sometimes the person that called, they not only talk themselves into being arrested, they've added a few charges? Hmm. Correct? We've all had that experience? Don't interrupt them. You've got the time, let them talk. Let them talk their way right into it. Don't interpret, be specific. Uh, I, I can't tell you how many times I've shown up on a traffic stop and I've, and I've pulled whoever was initial contacted, who was in with initial contact with the subject, and I said, what did they say? Well, they said they wanted to do such, 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 and I said, what am I talking? I said, yeah, what's up, what's going on? Nothing, I just got to pee. Where'd you get that? Don't interpret. Just listen to what they say. They'll be specific with you most of the time. And never, never, ever. God, does that suck? I can't stand. I don't. I can't stand when anyone does that. I see a cop doing that, especially a cop I'm working with. Oh my God! Insulting people. I saw a YouTube video recently of some jackass. Bail bondsman who was picking up a skip. He engaged this guy for about 35 minutes, pulled his taser four or five times. I think he even cleared leather once. And the whole time kept calling him names. Escalating, escalating, escalating. I was like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Don't insult people. Nobody here likes to be insulted. As a professional, we have to take the hit. As a comic, I have to take the hit. But I had to be able to turn it around and make it funny or act like it didn't hurt. It does hurt. But nobody gives a shit about your hurt feelings. Be professional. Don't respond with an insult if you are insulted. This is the five step tactical process that I now use when I'm in contact with the public, especially on a specific call. Maybe not casually, but on a call. A whopper. Ask, always present it as an interrogative, always present it as a question. I understand it, but do you think we can stand over here for just a second and talk about that? Always, always, always ask. Why? I don't want to go over there. Why should I have to go over there? I don't have to talk to you. Well, you don't have to talk to me, but I would prefer it if you did talk to me and if we could do it over here out of the way. 
so that we're not in, 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 in a way in your state, in the now state, I would really appreciate that. You're building that common ground. You're starting to communicate with their value systems. Options, again, use descriptive, positive imagery. Tell them why it's in their best interest to comply, cooperate, or collaborate. Don't threaten them with the hammer. That only works in, in rare occasions. Let me ask you a question, because I can't remember this ever in my entire adult life. Has anybody here ever reacted from anger and had it pay off for them? Thank you. Nor I. There's been one or two times where I got really pissed at something. And I went, oh yeah, dude, boom. It felt good for that one. It's called negative karma for you people who study Eastern traditions. Here's the part for us in law enforcement. Once you've given them options, and you've described in a positive way what it is they should be doing, where it is you'd like them to go, we need to confirm compliance or non-compliance. That is, the subject has refused. They have said in no uncertain terms they are not going to do what you have advised them, directed them, or asked them to do. They are not going to do it. This is where you jujitsu guys get really good. The last part here is an acronym. Act is either going to be act or don't act. Most likely, it's going to be arrest, contain, and transport. So, once you've confirmed, here's what you said. Sir, ma'am, I completely understand your situation. However, I am required to, by law, X, Y, and Z. You then say, is there anything that I or my partner can say to you to get you to comply. Now this does a couple of things. You have stated what your position is. You have stated what you require to do. That's hook one. You have then reiterated, is there anything that I or my partner can do? This is, this is going down from non-verbal to use of force. Is there anything that I or my partner can say for you to comply? And as you say this, you move in closely and you get quiet because people lean in when they get quiet. People start to calm down when you get quiet. You lean on I understand that. You really have to come with me. Is there anything at all that I or my partner can say? At that moment, if they meet you with equal or greater force, you hook them up because you've already stated the obvious. You've already gone through the steps. That's the time you don't hesitate you take them right down and you take them in. You put this in your report. Once you've taken them in, you've stated this, you make this your mantra, this is your system. Remember, there's no secret to success. Success is a system. This is the system. You completely understand the situation. You're giving them the overview. However, by law, I have to do X, Y, and Z. Is there anything, hope number one, that I or my partner can do to say, to get you to comply, hook number two. Those are the fangs of the cobra. Remember, you're the chameleon and you're the cobra. The minute they go, well, you don't, know, they're down. And then you can articulate this in your report and you can bring it in to court. And you say, yeah, this is what I do every single time that I have contact with the public. Nobody ever taught me this. I had to go find it. I had to go look it up. Oh, no, that's one that's an act of disengage. Okay, we're going to review the tactical five-step plan. We ask, correct? Mm -hmm. We don't command. What's the next one? Awaka uh, is the is the acronym. We why? We explain. We inform. We communicate within their value system. We tell them why they're doing it, why it's in their best interest to do what we are asking them to do. We offer options. Well, you know, tell you what, 
if you don't do that, I mean, I see you heading home. And well, man, I would love to be home right now. You know, I got to just got this brand new big screen TV. What do you? You have Netflix? What do you got? Wouldn't you love to be home watching Netflix and you know, not dealing with this nonsense? Because I want to get you home and get you in front of that TV with your legs up and a nice uh, a Bud Light, your baby a fat sack of tragedy spouse. <laughs> Offer options. Build a positive. <laughs> you dealt with this person? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Was it the same person? Did we arrest the same <laughs> Confirm non-compliance. You asked them. You reiterated, you are now in the five-step process. If it has to come to this, confirming they're not, you're confirming. You've asked, you've asked, you've asked. Is there anything? They're going to say no. It's time to act. Act. You're going to arrest, contain, and transport. Questions? Anybody? <laughs> Sorry, dude, I had to do it. <laughs> <laughs> You're pointing me under the bus. You got it. He, he, made, he made me do that. <laughs> and you know what's funny? I didn't realize at first that it was Urkel's dad. I'm going, who is that? And he's, he's, he's getting mad at me. It's Urkel's dad. Who do you think he was mad at me? I know you wouldn't know. And by the way, I just want to tell you one thing. Never underestimate old man strength. There was a guy in my academy. His name was Jeffrey Burns. He was... He was older than me, he was like 56. And we had a kid, his name was uh, Anthony LaPorta, who was, he could, he could run like a jack rabbit, he could bench press 300 pounds. And the two of them got on the mat, Ernst had 20 years in the correctional system, and LaPorta was, you know, he was a gym rat. Who showed that video of the bodybuilding in his ass kick, right? He was a gym rat, they got on the mat, and in about 15 seconds, LaPorta was cuffed and stuff. So, oh, who does? Right there. Why? Let's see what happens. Go ahead. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. He'll bring it up a notch. Questions, comments, concerns? Oh, I gave you a handout, by the way. Um, you all get it. You all get it. This is a DVD. Do you remember those? This, I found this yesterday, interestingly enough. This is a CD. A lot of the principles that I used in here, I. I actually pulled off of this, this is from 2006. This was called Top 10 Lessons of the Worst Year of My Life. It was a pretty rugged year that year. It was almost as bad as 2020. And many of the things that I shared uh, from this uh, presentation are also in this CD. I only have a couple of these if anybody wants one. If they're free, they make great print posters. But there's some really good things in here. And there's, the last thing I'd like to leave you with is a quote from a cowboy, his name was Frank Jackson. Does anybody know who he was? He was a cowboy in the 19th century, Frank Jackson. It's a great uh, quote, maxim, if you will, on how to live life. He said, uh, guard your thoughts, they become your words. Guard your words, they become your actions. Guard your actions, they become your habits. Guard your habits, they become your character. Guard your character, it becomes your destiny. That's the basis for tactical 